Bobby, join us first on stage from the audio team. Give him a round of applause. We've got some fans, got some fans. Up next, we've got Cliff Schult. You might recognize him from our Forge Fundamentals videos and our Forge panel earlier today. And then last but certainly not least, Donnie, head of our multiplayer map art team. Donnie, thank you so much for joining us today. How's it going, guys? Good, yeah, how are you? Good. There, Robbie, come on in a little bit, come on in. I thought you were gonna sit uncomfortably. Yeah. I, I know, closer. I was like, let's get, let's get cozy, let's get comfy, we're talking some Halo multiplayer. Uh, guys, how's it going? You enjoying yourself here today? Yeah. Since Donnie got here, it's been even better. Definitely. I agree with that. Yeah, Donnie always brightens up my day too. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about multiplayer maps, what goes into it. You guys ready? Yeah, let's go. Totally. I think so, yeah. All right. So you guys want to do a little intro yeah, background for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, Donnie Taylor. I've been at 343 for 11 years now, basically since it started as a relatively small team out in Willows. Uh, I started as a lead technical, or sorry, a technical artist, lead technical artist, environment artist, multiplayer art lead, art director. Been here for all the games, worked some on Reach as well. Uh, happy to be here to share what I know. 12 years. 12 years. Dang. I'm old. Nice. <laughs> Not old. Experienced. Experienced. That's what you say to old people. <laughs> How about you, Cliff? Yeah, so my name's Cliff Scholl. I'm uh, hey. Got some fans. <laughs> Lots of fans in the crowd for uh, Cliff. So I was originally a, a community forger, and I got my way into doing level design. So I've been at 3 for 3 now for about five years. Has it really been five years already? Yeah, weird, right? Yeah, that's incredible. Robbie, how about you? My name is Robbie Elias. I've been with 343 for over 11 years. Uh, started working on Halo 4 in the early days and have been there since. <laughs> we got a, a veteran nod squad. A lot. Veteran <laughs> squad up here. <laughs> Not old, experienced, veteran squad. Thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh, so first, we're gonna talk a little level design. Yeah, so this is the level design section of the, of the whole panel. Uh, obviously, as you can see, it says cake first, broccoli last. That's how I describe level design. We get to do design. That's like the sweet spot of everything. And then once you're done, there's a lot of hard work after, afterwards, managing the map, making sure it's true. <coughs> so uh, some of the things I'm going to be talking about is going to be how does it start? What are the things you consider? about making a map, things are running through your head, uh, so forth. <clears throat> so some of the things I'm thinking about like when I'm making a map, I'm thinking about like what kind of play styles, what kind of equipment, items, uh, things on the map I want to put on. And the other thing too uh, that's really important is the early development of a map uh, during Infinite is the sandbox is undefined. Uh, we're trying to be malleable with our maps. so we as a team can work. It's not just me about making a, a sick map and just only me, it's about everyone succeeding. <clears throat> and so it, it was kind of difficult at first trying to be like, okay, all the player heists set in, what are all these equipments, how are they interacting, are they too powerful, too little, how can we showcase them? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, there's a couple images here on screen. One is early Aquarius and early earlier Behemoth uh, from our uh, design by Tyler and Shrewd. Um, now, if we want to go to yeah, talk the a next part. Testing. Yep. Yeah, so testing and iteration. The biggest thing I'll say is don't knee jerk. Mm -hmm. Let things soak, get enough feedback in there. And sometimes people say like, oh man, this map is terrible. If your name is Nate, you just say his dog. <laughs> but the thing is, uh, yeah, you let it soak because maybe there's something awesome and people haven't found the depth of the map, right? Because the map is going to be, be played for all of the life cycle. So how do you find that depth and how do you not just change something to accommodate for, something, for someone? Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go to the art part. So this yeah. is um, <laughs> oh, the handing off to art, right? Um, this is, a, this is where I call broccoli. Because it's, it's, when handing off to art, you have to kind of educate the artist that you're paired with, right? So it's a collaboration. So 
So You're saying they're, they're not educated? No, no, they're definitely educated. <laughs> but their perception of the map, they're looking at an artistic standpoint. Mm. How do they make like key features stand out, beauty shots, so, so forth? Putting, putting beautiful composition and putting light on it, basically my job. In the sight lines? Right in the sight line. <laughs> block them intentionally. I wonder Sweet. if Cliff will notice. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's like, so my perception of the map is like, hey, these sight lines are important. We can't pit like a tree vine here because you're able to be able to snipe across the map. Or hey, we can't pit a crate here because now they can be able to jump up. And so it's a collaboration. Sometimes like ours like Cliff, what you made is terrible. Like we cannot make sense of this. And so we'll have to turn it, bring it back in, make it make sense for gameplay and the arts vision of, of the map that they're trying to go after. Which normally comes first? The gameplay or the art? Um, Chicken or the egg? Gameplay. Gameplay. Well, I mean, gameplay. it's kind of a mix, right? Because sometimes, like... I gave I, you a free out. Well, it's like, I want to work with the artist, like, yeah. saying, like, what do we vision this map to be, right? Like, yeah. for example, fragmentation, we automatically knew is going to be a forerunner map. Here's, a, here's kind of like a style guide, because it's like a city map compared to a natural train map, you got to have that kind of defined. Because sometimes city, city maps like be thin walls, and other maps might have like thick walls. And so, like, how do you make your design play well, but also be able to lean into the art direction of the map? Yeah, that extends really well to Forerunner, which has a lot of angles and a lot of things that you traditionally don't see that affect us from art, but also affect gameplay quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, that, that Forerunner art style, you kind of have to know going into yeah. a Forerunner map yeah. that you're going to have those ramps, angles, and all that stuff. Totally, gotcha. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then so up next. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the your the little final of polish. polish. Yeah. Is, um, there is um, when when you get the map back from art, you got to make sure all, all the game modes are working. Got to make sure all the spawns are working. Then like there's like little geo things like where like a lot of the ramps in our games that will actually put like invisible like stair steps. Mm -hmm. I, I think I actually have like a, a picture of it later on. Yeah. But it's like, how do you make the map feel and flow well, so players don't get like toe caught on something and blame the map like, oh, this is a terrible map because I was like on an overkill spree here and I caught the stinking edge. Yeah. Those ankle catches sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know what you're talking about. So yeah, yeah let's what take a this look. is uh, this is a a fly through of an early day uh, recharge block out. Uh, I took this over from uh, uh, a designer named um, Adrian Bo uh, Bedoya. Adrian Bedoya, yeah. Yep, he he made a plaza from Halo Five. Like I, I, I believe I he like, did rig as well in Halo Five. Yes, yeah. he did. Yeah, excellent maps. So you can see this looks pretty darn close to recharge his final. Yeah, yeah. The bones are there, right? Like this this shot right here, we did not have the death pit, and. Um, when we we're starting to get equipment in, like Repulsa got was made, and we're like, "This is this is awesome. How do we how do we showcase this on the map here?" And so we blew out that section of the wall, made a death pit, and then also add something like to entice players to jump across. Oh, there's an energy sword there, but there's a guy underneath with a repulsor, like being a troll and waiting to push you back into the death pit, right? Yeah. And if this guy with a sword, he's even more clever. He gets a grab hook to come back up and back whack him. Uh -huh. So equipment kind of helping change that map up a little bit. You had to make some changes once that came in. Say that again, sorry. Once you started getting more equipment items in the yeah. sandbox, that also impacted how you approached making the map. Totally. It's like, like I was saying, like, sandbox is not defined yet. How do we, like, showcase their stuff when there's something that's really awesome? And how do we change our maps and, like, hand sh shake uh, hands well with, with the sandbox? Very nice. So yeah, if we go to the next like slide, a couple like, comparison these are shots. some like different angles from the changes that we've done. So uh, the the pistons or B, if you want to call it, um, th that was wider. They had more more pistons in the middle of it. We we reduced it down. The top goal didn't have the catwalk that went over. Um, and if we go to the next one, yeah, you can see the long haul. You didn't have the overhang up there. The I call it nerdy nades, but the nade panel up there was really high. You had to jump up, and uh, when you're on C, you can. Sh the problem with that one 
you can shoot the people's feet and they didn't know where they're getting shot at. So we had to bring it down. And on the second image, you, the stairs wasn't an elbow. So we had to adjust that to make that um, flow well instead of having like people can just jump up the stairs automatically. Uh, let's go to the next one. Yeah. Oh yeah, middle's kind of the same. Back, back uh, gold. There was a height up there. We flattened that down to allow the flow to be a little more understandable. Because a lot of times, what would happen, people would come through here and would automatically get back whacked. Um, and let's go to the next one. Sure. Okay. So yeah, elevator. Oh, actually, sorry. This top image, uh, control BR. This, this has been stayed pretty dang true. Uh, this, this area worked really well for the map. We didn't have to change much. And the bottom one is we did not have the elevator like jump through, so we added that in there as well. Uh, the back jump up that you yep. can clamber up? And All right, and then this is, uh, this is the early version of Streets Block Out. Should get started here in a second. There we go. Very old. So yeah, this map was a lot smaller, so we, we kind of added some areas to, uh, to increase um, room for the map and, and how players are flowing through. And I'm probably butchering this because I was not the designer on this. This is Alex Bean. He's probably in the crowd right now, shaking his head, yelling at play, player metrics at me. <laughs> <laughs> but again, this map is also, it stayed pretty true to its original. Yeah, you can kind of see some of the bones, right? Like this area, uh, top of A, we didn't have the backside yet. Yep. I think that was like one of the last changes Alex done to the map. We cut some alleyways for Forge late into the game, or late into the development. Say that again. We cut some backways for Forge yep. later on. Yep. Yeah, so there is secret backways to the map that we've added so people can build a Forge on them. Uh, yeah, so this is the biggest change. You could not see from, there was no B rails. And so that was another change that Alex has done that helped open up the map. Yeah, that that slight a er, that area right there is a little bit changed instead of the jump up into that bricks room. It's yep. kind of that ramp, yeah. But otherwise, pretty darn faithful, pretty much yep. identical. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. That's so here are some so here are some di different angles. Uh, you can definitely tell like the from cafe how the shotgun spawn how that's changed up a lot. Uh, it was really cool when Alex put that long sight light in. That that was really fun. Uh, obviously, the top image I have, uh, it shows how you didn't have that back, uh, back behind A to be able to flow through there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, behind A to, uh, towards that cafe. Yeah. And then the top image shows the B rails is not opened up. Uh, same, as, same as bottom one. And then, uh, so the top one is a B street. One thing you can't really tell in here is it used to be actually a lot higher. So when you're climbing up there, it was, it was actually a bigger uphill. And uh, the one thing that I was really upset about, that Alex got rid of, which made sense. If you look at the very top, there used to be a, a platform you stand up, and you, that's where shocks originally spawned on the map. I really enjoyed that area. I was always a nerd up there, and he, he removed my little nerdy ledge. I would remo remove your nerdy ledge too. Yeah. Don't worry. Art was very happy as well. Rest in peace, the village. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this Ooh. is the quality of life stuff. Yeah. So this is like our, uh, our invisible collision. So uh, Kaylee, our lead level designer, he kind of taught me this trick. And so around like uh, these corners of the of ramp stairs, we will add like little like boxes on top. We don't want it super smooth because we still want to feel like it's an edge. But we don't want players to get caught and be like, they can't see why they're getting caught. And they get, you know, if they're in the middle of in a BR fight and strafing. Uh, another good example above the player model on the right, uh, uh, that was actually added later on because players would get caught and they did not understand why they would get caught. So that's another good quality of life. Ah, from on top of the boxes to the ramp? Yep. <laughs> this is good for R2 because we don't have to make, like, if we had to actually make the geometry to account for that little ramp physically, the ramp would always look weird or feel weird, or we'd have to solve it in a way that would just make the flow of the map feel different. So this is a nice compromise between art and design to keep the map flow well, but still hold true to what a ramp looks like. Yeah, I think that's the last of my panel.
<laughs> All right. I think. Very nice. Yes, look at that. Oh, hey, look at me. Art. Let's I go. I was talking about art. Wait, we got to go back one. I got an intro. Oh, oh. Oh, sorry. My bad. No, uh, no. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, we can go ahead. Hey, Donnie Taylor here to chat with you about art. Um, as Cliff just talked about, we are a big gameplay first. That extends all the way to art. Uh, I know from lots of experience that we have the ability to sort of enhance or break a lot of what the blockout was. And a really big part of what we do is making sure that we maintain the magic that we found during the months of playtests and iterations and stuff that the design team do. And another thing about art is it's a, it's a conversation, right? There's a, cinema, like a passing of the torch, but we don't run and leave design behind. We're constantly interacting with them throughout the entire phase. They're in our art reviews back and forth. It's very collaborative. Uh, we can go through the next phase. I got you. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, so what you're going to see here is Live Fire. Internal name is Interlock. It's going to probably call all of our maps the wrong name, so I apologize there. <laughs> uh, but you can kind of see as we progress through. So the next few slides are going to talk at a very high level. There's a lot that goes into this art side of things, like a lot of people involved, a lot of process. It's just a lot to cover in the 30 minutes and 20 seconds we have left. So I'm going to stay at kind of a high level and sort of walk you through what it takes to t from a map to go from blockout to basically in your hands before we talk to audio. Go to the next slide. All right. So after we get the block out from design, we do what we call a proxy phase. You can kind of think of this like a squint test or like a thumbnail. It's kind of where we take the block out and turn it into the essence of what the map will be. That means time of day lighting, rough materials, like is the tree brown, is the rock gray, is the good example here, right? You know, we were going to have a very nice feel for each stuff. We knew for blueprint, we wanted it to be like a water treatment facility. So we had a lot of things in mind and that sort of color swash kind of gets us in a good state as we're running through the map and also gives us an idea of as we're moving if we're breaking anything or if the lighting is too dark it's just a good setup phase uh, also in this phase we do things that we set up rough effects anything that moves i should move closer hello uh, anything that moves or uh, would impact gameplay um, stuff like that and for those wondering, uh, Blueprint is Recharge. Correct. Blueprint, sorry, yes. Yeah. Blueprint is Recharge, yes. There's there in the bottom left on your screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apologies. No worries. Keep me honest. Yeah, I got you. I got you. <laughs> so after we take, our prox actually we take our proxy phase, we run it through our amazing concept team, and we have them sort of flesh out the vision in a very fast two-dimensional way. They can concept stuff way faster than it will take us to realize in 3D, and it kind of gives us a head start on things. We concept pretty much everything. We've concept trees. We concept the beautiful beauty corners or points of interest that you see on screen. Uh, props, basically anything that adds life or helps us tell a story in a visual sense. And this phase continues throughout most of the map well into the next phases because we're constantly iterating on it, constantly getting art direction feedback. Uh, and we keep moving through the process. And are these concepts paint overs or are they separate? They're mixed. Most of them here are paint overs. Uh, for instance, Live Fire is our sort of beauty corner area paint over where we take a section of the map and we take it as far as we can with what we have so that we can make sure that our assumptions about what the map will look like actually read well and fill well. And it also sort of gives us the mindset of what we need to build or what tech we are missing. Because oftentimes, for instance, for Behemoth, we ran into a lot of roadblocks. And as we were going through, we realized it would be awesome to have tire treads on the sand. Our train tool at the time didn't actually let us do that, so we added it to our list, had people start working on it. It's sort of like a good good chance to gut check. A vertical slice is what most people would probably call it, but on the art sense. Uh, it's also a good chance to get us sort of the lighting mood. Mm, the lower yeah. uh, right is Aquarius, and originally we actually had painted a red side and a blue side sort of a warning side that was supposed to be shut down and overgrown. We later ended up changing it slightly to not be that. Uh, it's a good idea of what's going on. Sweet. All right. So Artify is probably our biggest phase and probably where we cause design the most headache, which I'm very proud of. Um, it's kind of where we take our squint test and we bring it into focus. It's, uh, we take everything that is a rough material and we slowly start adding to it section by section. Uh, we do a very solid lighting pass. Um, we take and start tuning our materials, start finding our concrete. Basically anything that's basically, I don't want to say making the map prettier, more 
bringing the map to a realization, essentially. Like at the end of the artifact phase, we've done our goal. If you can tell what the map is, it's mostly shippable, though we'd still want to do a lot more work to it. And you can just sort of get the feel. It's also a good chance, uh, as we find, as you run through the map, a lot of people make assumptions as they're running through a blockout or a proxy about what it might look like, and they sort of get married to that look. And then when we get to this phase, oftentimes we veer in a direction, and we get some interesting feedback about people being like, oh, you went, you went that way. Mm. And it's, it's very good back and forth. It actually dictates sort of the way that we change our maps. Um, but yeah, move forward. Ooh. Oh, right, we got a video. So this is actually recharged about halfway through the Artify process. I think I still have the name on here say Blueprint, so apologies. <laughs> uh, but this gives you a pretty good idea of where we're, we're almost about to roll into the polish phase for this. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a good idea of where we are, what's survived the Artify phase, and also what changed during the Artify phase. So you can see a lot of it is dark. Um, there's some neat uh, shadow stuff in there that we really had to dial back because it, it wasn't great for performance, but it also made the players very hard to read. Mm -hmm. And we're yep, constantly yep. going back and forth trying to figure that out. Um, you can also see you've got a good material responses. There's lighting bugs that I'm sure you'll see with the lights flickering. Uh, got some animations in, but we don't have the final effects in for it. Uh, but this is, this is a very solid phase for us to be in. And this map sort of does a really good job of expressing where we are. And you got my little art cuts about. Usually after this phase, what we do, particularly for this map, is we'd actually send it back to concept again. And we'd be like, OK, it's missing, like for this one, right? We're like, it's missing color. It's very monochromatic. And we'd go through the phase of quickly just experimenting, adding color, changing of materials in a very fast, two-dimensional way. We can kick out stuff in like a couple of days that would probably take us a week to do. And we find a look that we like, we move forward. This is actually great, the barrels, because this was our temp solve for trying to figure out some weirdness that we were running into and eventually ended up finding a slightly better solution. Uh, but that was, that was fun. This is also, I believe these don't move yet, do they? No, they don't move yet. Um, this was us blocking in and then later adding sort of some animations that would be that we also, again, later tweaked. I think in polish phase we ended up tweaking them because we just couldn't find the right rhythm to them. The other interesting thing about this phase is we ended up changing a lot of the lighting for navigation. A lot of times you can see two doors that unless you know, unless the lighting or there's something that guides you, you don't actually know that the two rooms are connected behind. So we do a lot of back and forth with our lighting and a lot of back and forth with play test, play test a ton. So really make sure that everything we're doing not only informs the story and the lore of what we're trying to tell with the map, but also, again, keeps the player flowing naturally through the map. Yeah, having that good gameplay readability yeah, really comes into play. Gameplay, yeah, having that good gameplay, To add to that, <clears throat> you were talking about the lighting. This is a good example of design working with lighting. Yes. The back orange hallway, we did, did that in deliberate because players could not see where that would go, and so we wanted to paint that orange right. so they understand that which doorways led to where in that back connect connection. So if you're standing in like the Whirlpool room, you see the one doorway, and you can see a top goal. You're like, oh, I'm pretty sure that connects there. Uh, you, you match the colors? Yeah. It gives you also a good chance to be like, hey, if I go here, I intercept him, or if he goes there, I start watching that door, that's where he's going to come out, because there's nowhere else he can come out. Um, gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. Keep moving? Yeah, we can keep Ooh, moving. Nice. Ah. Sorry, my eyesight. Sweet. So this is probably one of my favorite phases, which is the polish phase. Um, it's only about 15%. It's one of our shorter phases when it comes to art, but it really accounts for a tremendous amount of life that we add to the map. Uh, later on, I have slides of the differences between the each ones. And you can really tell just how much we do. Uh, we do everything, not just the visuals you see, right? Uh, a lot of the grease pass, as Kaylee calls it, where we go through the collision and we work with design on. Uh, more tweaking of sort of the ambience. Uh, we spend a lot of time working on the post-processing of the map so that we pull the players out. Uh, since we let players choose a wide variety of colors and skins and shapes, uh, it's very easy for you to sort of play the map with a specific skin to get an advantage. We work really hard to make sure that uh, we can pull everyone out as best we can, make everyone readable. And then we also add a tremendous amount of kickables that I'm sure design loves that we add. Um, and also begin setting up sort of like the foundations of working with Robbie on the audio side about what sort of sounds work out when. Um, this is usually around the time that audio steps in and starts doing just a rough pass. 
I was about to ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where does Robbie fit in on this? <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> we're okay, getting there. Cool, we're getting cool. there. <laughs> there. There's a few. There's a few things that have to be true for a map before audio steps in because of a lot of our uh, audio systems that I'm sure Robbie will will happily tell us about. Uh, but yeah, this is this is. You can really tell, particularly if you go to the next slide. Um, oh, apologies. <laughs> we skipped a step. I'm sorry. I missed the most important step, which is all of the content we have been putting into our map over the past several months uh, always comes with a little bit of a tax. Uh, it's not free. And we usually find that in bugs. I think a great way I like to think about our bugs is you're playing with a Jenga board that's a mile in diameter and a mile high and you remove a piece or add a piece and you think it's good and then someone on the other side of the Jenga board pulls a piece and then somewhere on the other side a part of the wall falls down. You never find it yeah. until later and how we find a lot of our bugs is either through our extensive playtesting or through our awesome QA department or honestly even through our fans and our UR tests who are very creative at breaking our game which we greatly appreciate. Uh, you can see, uh, everyone knows what the upper right one is. That's one of my favorites. Um, that was a great bug when we found that. Uh, the bottom one actually is uh, bizarre early on. We knew we wanted a ton of fruit stands, like a ridiculous <laughs> amount of fruit stands. Uh, yeah, and it looks like you got a lot of fruit stands. <laughs> so we were, we were <laughs> testing our boundaries. I like to do that with the design team. We're testing our limits. How much dynamic stuff could we put in before they start to freak? And so I think we put in like... I don't know, 20 or 30. Um, turns out our engine doesn't like that, and they they grow slightly sentient and start attacking you when you start running into <laughs> them. Uh, it's it's really fun. Uh, there was there was a lot of we had a lot of fun with these fruit stands. Everything from the way they broke to the way they broke our game. Um, it was it was really awesome. This is probably one of my favorite bugs. Uh, also, probably led to a lot of our fruit stands getting cut. But uh, you know, you win some, you lose some. I remember the uh, wet floor sign was in, I believe, oh. the first tech preview yeah. uh, before Infinite yeah. came out, and that was a, a fun one for people to find. Yeah, I think some somewhere along the lines I got blamed for that. I don't know why, um, but it's <laughs> not my fault. <laughs> I blame Cliff. No, actually, I think I know who to blame for <laughs> that, but we're not going to talk about that. Hey, I do want to add something, Donnie, about working with art, and you, you mentioned lighting. I did. That's, whenever a... Uh, Lighting artist has to come talk to me, especially Tyler. <clears throat> he, uh, I always tell him like, "Hey Tyler, you're here to brighten up my day." Oh, clever! Uh, oh, okay. clever. I'm sorry for the dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Next slide. All right. <laughs> All right. So Ooh. this is okay. this is a great example of uh, moving from sort of the design phase to the end of our uh, art phase, essentially. At this point, what you're seeing on our right is what you're playing today. It's had all of its polish. It's all set up and ready to roll. This was actually about the phase and looks about right where we're going to hand over to our friend over here. And uh, this is about when they plug in fully. Awesome. Let's dive um, in. So I'm going to talk about the audio for the maps. Uh, we usually come in around the geolock stage. So if you want to go to the next path, I want to recognize that that edit you made to the slide. He's got a headphones well, on. Well, Donnie did that for me. I Donnie that. made oh, all did you know, slides Did you notice the great. first slide for Clips <laughs> was not the chief helmet? No. Yeah, you have oh. to go back and look at okay. it. Someone's going to have to check the rebroadcast. I did notice yours had a bunch of color on it. Yeah, but I felt bad. I was like, I added color, and everyone else didn't, and I felt bad. So <laughs> I modified. Cliff asked me to do something, and then uh, Robbie, I just said, here you go. Very nice, very nice. Um, so the first pass that audio does is an acoustics pass. And this determines um, our obstruction values for all sounds and our occlusion for all sounds. So obstruction is basically um, if a structure is in between the sound and you as the player, it will cause the sound to sound muffled or not as clear. Oh, yeah, too, Mike, not a little, close enough? Uh, a little closer that's better? Helps. Yes. That's I was fantastic. worried about being too Thank loud. You, I'm an audio person, so I forget. <laughs> Anyways, um, so that's what obstruction is. It's basically how geo can affect a sound. So if you go behind a structure, like in that picture, there's the Whirlpool machine in recharge between the one sparked in fire and then the other one listening to it. That gunfire is going to sound muffled because there's a structure in front of it. Occlusion is how sounds travel from room to room. So in old Halo games, we did not have an advanced system. But in this one, we have an advanced system that simulates audio traveling from room to room better 
and more accurate to real life. So what it'll do is if somebody is firing in a different room, the audio will actually reposition itself to a portal or a doorway so that it plays from the nearest open area to the next room. This actually helps gameplay a lot because not only are you hearing somebody firing their gun in another room, but you're also hearing it from the nearest direction to get there. In old games, you just hear that somebody was firing on the other side of the wall, and if you didn't know the map really well, you'd have to figure out how to get there. So it kind of helps you without you even realizing it. I remember, um, what was it, like five or six years ago when this first came on, and you were demonstrating it, how much of a difference it made through the map. Yeah. Just, it, was it definitely crazy. makes the map sound better as well. Yeah. So it's a very nice detail that's working behind the scenes that does a lot of work. If you go to the next slide, um, how we do it is a technical audio designer will actually go in and draw acoustic zones for every room. What? <laughs> is that you? Not me, actually. Yeah. Oh. We have a large audio team that does this kind of stuff. So He, he rides on tanks. What was that? Uh, he rides on tanks. Yeah, I just does record on sounds tanks. and take fancy <laughs> selfies. But um, basically, they'll draw acoustic zones for every room. And they'll draw acoustic portals for every doorway. And basically, an acoustic zone will scan a room and figure out all the geo that's in there and lets the audio know um, what it can and can't go through. And acoustic portals lets it know what it can use to get from one zone to another. It can't go from one zone to another zone without a portal. Acoustic zones also contain a lot of information, like the type of reverb to use, the type of gun tail to play, and also the type of 2D sound to play. Uh, acoustic portals tell the sound how much of it can come through it. So it's like the difference between an open window and a closed window. It's also one of the reasons why audio comes in so late into the map's development, because it would be very bad if Robbie and the team set all that up and we decided to remove a wall or close yeah. the door. Any differences between the geo after that point can throw it off. So if you throw a grenade in a corner, you might not hear it clearly because it thinks that there's geo there when it's not. So it has to come in after geo lock, and Donnie has to behave and not change the geo. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's a bug, and then yeah. I'm allowed to fix it. Yeah. Uh, and then create another bug in the slide. process. Um, this is a picture of live fire with all the zones and portals that Zeke, our uh, senior technical audio designer, drew. Spent a lot of time doing that. Uh, if you notice that line of blue along the right side, that's actually several portals that he had to place just so you can hear the pelican that flies in the skybox. Without that, you would never hear that pelican because it's in a different zone than the rest of the play space. Yeah, I was curious why, why we placed the audio zones on the edge of the map just for that exterior. Yeah, you have to account for any fancy art stuff Donnie does in the skybox. <laughs> <laughs> to dig a little bit more why we do the fancy art stuff in the skyboxes, we have, um, there's a lot of behind, under the hood technical scaffolding that we have to set up. And one of those things is we partition up our level for memory optimization and for um, sometimes for more light map resolution, or I guess in our case, light probe resolution. Uh, so that creates Again, more interesting things to solve, and that's where the audio team came in. It's like, okay, we can solve the fact that you now took your map and basically split it into two maps. Um, so we appreciate it. I appreciate you, Robbie. Thank you. Um, so another pass we do is we place audio emitters. So a technical audio designer will go in and they'll place um, audio emitters so that I can play 3D sounds to support anything that Donnie creates, like a machine, a vent. Our team creates art team creates. I will stop blaming art Donnie for everything. <laughs> um, so there's some examples of things that audio emitters can be used for. They can be a point source or a spline. A spline is just a complex line that we can use to cover rivers and longer things where we want the sound to follow the player as they're walking along it. Um, they also have, you see the graph in the top right corner, that's a attenuation curve. And that is basically how we control how the sound uh, it, like the volume of the sound as you walk away from it. So every sound has an attenuation curve and it's uh, custom and set up unique just for that moment. Every single one of those audio emitters you custom tune? Yeah, the most popular wow. one is the footstep one. 
Mm. Pro team loves to complain or iterate on that one. So Footsteps so sounds are always uh, a popular topic of discussion in yep. <laughs> any game, really. Yep. You yeah. just have a ninja yeah. fantasy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but So you, you really go through on every map, customize all of these. Yes, and if you go to the That's next so cool. slide, yeah. you'll see how many. Um, so this is wow. uh, top down of Bazaar, and Joshua, our technical audio designer, went in and was meticulous and placed every one of those green dots, which represent the sounds. And the list of audio positionals for the map is on the left there. So there's a lot of different things that we placed in there to make Bazaar sound like it's alive. All, all the more reason why Robbie will murder us if we go in and change anything after this <laughs> step. Yeah, these have to be aligned with the art. If they're not, then it'll you'll hear like water drips when there's no puddle, or you'll hear like a vent when there's no vent. Gotcha. Makes total sense. Uh, we also do audio for dynamic objects, so like BTB big moments, for example, or like the loot cave and fragmentation. Um, also the piston and recharge and the uh, breakable stuff and bizarre. Um, one of the most complex ones that's worth talking about is the uh, laser in breaker. So that one was a technical and creative challenge. So we had to work around a lot of technical limitations that our engine has, as well as creative challenges. You, you also had to work early with design on that yeah. so we, uh, to see how it played the whole map. Yeah, I was actually just about to touch on that. That comes into the creative challenge there. So level design actually wanted a sound that you can hear across the map uh, so that players know that the laser is about to fire and they don't die in an unjust way. Um, so I had to figure out a sound that could play across the map every minute for 15 minutes. So on average in a match, it's going <laughs> to play 15 times. So I had to figure out how to make a sound that did not annoy players, mm -hmm. but also communicated that the laser was going to go on. Uh, it was really tough. That's for actually sure. a good point to touch on for um, Greg's map, where we put that beautiful waterfall in. And then you were like, why did you put an amazing waterfall five feet away from our play space? Do you not know how loud a waterfall actually is? Yeah, that attenuation curve for that waterfall yes. was uh, set up meticulously by Joshua as well to make sure that you weren't hearing white noise the whole time you were in the map. <laughs> I also had to make sure the sound of the waterfall was not too white noisy too because that can really disrupt gameplay. And it's important to note that all ambient sounds need to sound a little bit stepped back so that they don't distract from sandbox uh, sounds because we don't want players not to be able to hear gunfire or not to be able to hear footsteps. So there's a balance between putting sounds in there and not getting in the way of the important sounds. So there's a hierarchy and ambiences are definitely on the lower, but we want to make sure it's as realistic as possible. Yeah, so gameplay always comes first though. Yes, that gameplay is always the comes direction first. that we have to follow kind of thing. Um, now I'm gonna talk about asset creation. So any given map, we'll create about 300 to 500 sounds for the map just for the map alone, just for ambiences. Um, in the bottom left corner, you'll see a digital audio workstation, and that's where I create the sounds, and that's a picture of the session where I created the sounds for streets. So um, basically what I do is I pull in a lot of source from several different locations. I might record it, make it with a synthesizer, or find it in our internal library, and I will affect it so that it sounds appropriate for the Halo universe and it fits in the map. And I will manipulate them by either layering, uh, splicing them together, affecting them with a plugin, or stretching it, pitching it down. There's lots of tools you can kind of do to do that. On the top right, you see a picture of my Eurorack synthesizer. I'm quite proud of that thing. It makes some really it's sweet really sounds. Really proud of that thing. Yeah. Um, this is a video that we're going to play. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear it, but it basically shows uh, collecting different source and the areas in which the source is kind of used in levels. You probably don't hear it here, but hopefully you can hear it on the stream. Uh, since we can't hear it here, I'll just talk over it. Yeah. Have um, you ever lost a mic in the water? You know, those mics were awfully close. I have close never to the... lost a mic okay. in the water. Say, yeah. Actually, yeah. Very <laughs> careful <laughs> answer there. <laughs> Oh, Ooh. there's the sound now. Okay. It might sound terrible here because of all the sound going around, but just know it sounds awesome if you're hey, just listening waterfall. to the video. This is actually a rain machine I made in our Foley room to simulate rain 
so <laughs> that I can put it in recharge. Does yep, your Does your boss know you were doing that? Huh? Does your boss know you were doing that in the he studio? He does now. <laughs> That's where all of our comps went to. Ooh, it really Ooh. gets bassy up here, huh? Wow. I apologize in advance. <laughs> That's a fridge that I found in a hotel room. That's the studio. You're yeah, punching the table. Yeah, it's a massage machine that I'm using to make our table, rattles though. for streets. That was an expensive Red Bull. Yeah. You just paid twice for it. Well, I, I, you know, I canceled. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so all the computer sounds go there, a lot of computers, hums and stuff like that. Refrigerator sounds go there, like the one I recorded in that hotel room. The beep from the Red Bull. <laughs> Red Bull on Aquarius. Yeah. These sounds were recorded at the Computer Museum in Seattle. I love that place. And the rattle from the studio is oh. right there. So all of these are those custom audio emitters you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Perfect, like hand touch, fine tune to be perfect. Yeah. This is, sounds so huge on here. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone saw our behind the scenes videos uh, that we were doing a few years ago, uh, Robbie was in charge of doing that, had a bunch of uh, video footage and the audio sounds recorded. And you can, you can see some of those on the Halo YouTube channel. Uh, that was an effort pretty much driven by Robbie and the audio team. Uh, they just love sharing their work with the community. And we're getting a closer look here now too. So you see all the synthesized sounds. Those were used for the breaker laser, as well as a lot of those um, metal creaks and hits were used for the structure that kind of moves on the right side of the breaker laser. Obviously, it sounds completely different from the source because you have to kind of dial it back and tune it so it sounds great in the environment. Another thing to note is the breaker laser actually sounds different if you're on the top layer versus if you're on the bottom layer. Oh, wow. And that's done using acoustic zones and mixed states. Uh, if you're in the bottom layer, you hear more lava being affected by the laser. If you're on the top, you hear more of just the laser and what's producing it kind of thing. Gotcha. So more that splash yeah, on, on the exactly. lower level. Exactly. We wanted it to sound much more nastier when you're down there versus a little bit cleaner when you're on the top of it. And we do that with acoustic zones and mixed states that can be set on them. So uh, the uh, technical audio team did a lot of favors for me. <laughs> I called in pretty much every one for the breaker laser. <laughs> and that's uh, how we do the audio for the map. Awesome. Well, closing thoughts, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I guess the I guess last thing I would like to add is while there's only three of us up there, it actually takes a small army to build all of these maps. We're very happy to be representing. Uh, but there is a tremendous amount of people uh, even tremendous amount of disciplines that weren't necessarily covered in here. They're all an amazing part of the team that it takes to actually take everything that we do and present it forward. So we really appreciate you spending almost 45 minutes with us. Uh, so anything else you two would like to add? Yeah, you know, you're saying about the big team size. Yeah. Uh, I get asked a lot about, like, K. Cliff, like, what's your pro tip about, like, you know, if I join the industry or anything like that, like, what's, like, my biggest thing I'll say is like teamwork. Like I can't stress that enough. You could probably be extremely good at your job or your skill, but if you have no teamwork, no one's going to be wanting to like see your vision through. No one's going to want to like be around if you're grumpy and so forth. So if you're working together, like you can achieve your dreams, my dreams, Robbie dreams, and so forth. Yeah, got to be a team player. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. If it wasn't Robbie. for Carson, that laser wouldn't sound good. <laughs> you, you survived, Robbie, by the way. You did good. Uh, any, any last closing thoughts? Uh, no, no, I'm good. No, you I'm good? good. <laughs> you good? Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us up here. Can I get a round of applause for the team behind making you, multiplayer thank you, maps in Halo Infinite? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, but, guys, thank you so much for joining, putting this presentation together for everyone. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed, and we will be... Uh, doing even more community stuff here on the stage. 
We've got, I believe, Steve and Jen coming up to read some awesome lines.